Well, thank you very much, Anna, and it's, uh, it's an, an honor to be here with the other uh, speakers who are doing such great work in upholding uh, human rights uh, in, in a world in which human rights are, are, are challenged really as, as, as never before by regimes like those of, uh, of Iran. Uh, my own involvement uh, in, in justice was at international courts that were established by the United Nations, uh, uh, the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, where I served as a senior trial attorney and, and chief of prosecutions, uh, tried the media leaders and, and others that were responsible for the murder of 800,000 men, women, and children uh, in 1994, and then later went to the Sierra Leone court uh, to be chief prosecutor and bring a former chief of state, uh, Charles Taylor, to trial. Unfortunately, that's not the kind of, of justice that we've had uh, for, for the victims of, of the Iranian regime, uh, particularly the, the this massacre, uh, which, of course, the regime continues to deny uh, uh, that didn't occur with uh, any kind of judicial process. Uh, it, of course, a judicial process that ends in, in execution uh, would, would violate international human rights law. But there was no judicial process. As, as we know here, there was essentially an inquisition where people, some of whom have even completed uh, their sentences for so-called political crimes, uh, were summarily uh, executed uh, in, in a way in which uh, all of the facts and circumstances, the, the, the names of the victims, the, uh, the place of interment, all of those things uh, were hidden so that we have these, these violations of international uh, human rights law and enforced the disappearance and extrajudicial uh, killing. These uh, crimes, however, are also crimes against humanity, a part of a widespread or systematic attack against the civilian population. They're, these people were not involved in a, in, in a conflict. It, uh, it uh, couldn't be said that it was even be done uh, because people were not, uh, you know, Shia uh, Muslims. Frankly, 90% uh, of, of, of the victims were. Uh, what this involved was, was individuals who objected uh, to this uh, theocratic autocracy uh, in, in Iran. And, and we've seen the effect of, of the impunity that has occurred uh, and basically the absence of justice uh, for these, these crimes. Uh, impunity breeds impunity. Uh, so we have a regime that went on to commit horrendous crimes uh, thereafter in 2019 and the suppression of of demonstrations and, and people exercising their rights to assembly and protest, and now these horrendous crimes, largely against women, since since uh, uh, last year in 2022, uh, and uh, uh, in each of these situations, uh, there's impunity and the, and the expectation that this regime can get away with it. And, and frankly, the regime then also sponsors groups uh, uh, in, in other regions that commit uh, similar crimes. Uh, in fact, the consequence of this is, is a situation where uh, around the world we see more and more, situ more and more places where regimes feel that they can commit these crimes. Uh, and, and as a result, it's not just Iran, but it's, but it's, uh, but it's everywhere. And it's a risk and it's a threat uh, to, to all of humankind, wherever they are, when these kind of uh, crimes can, can be committed uh, without, uh, without, without consequences. Um, I appreciate in particular the, the mention of uh, these universal jurisdiction cases. Uh, I know sometimes it's been difficult, as, as I know all of you uh, uh, realize, to get attention to things that happened in, in, in 1988, uh, now some 35 years ago. Uh, but frankly, actually, these uh, cases in third countries are frankly very common in, in, man, in years uh, long after the crimes are committed. Uh, and sometimes even there are situations where countries go through transition and they begin to hold people to account for, uh, for horrible crimes. And, and sometimes I know there's criticism when Germany brings 99-year-old people to trial for, uh, for their involvement in the, in, the, in the Holocaust. But it sends an extremely important signal uh, that when crimes like this are committed against uh, innocent men, women, and children, there should be no rest for those perpetrators in this life. That for as long as they live and wherever they go, they face the prospect of justice. And that's why I was so happy to see the action of the Swedish prosecutor. And I'm involved in working with that prosecutor on Syrian cases. They're also doing cases now out of South Sudan against corporate leaders in, in Sweden. Some say justice is only for one group. Uh, we'll prosecute people from other countries. No, they're, they're prosecuting some of their own. 
and, and they have a, a system that uh, is extremely strong in, in protecting human rights and assuring that the people like, uh, you know, uh, Nadine Khoury, uh, Nouri had, uh, uh, had effective legal counsel. And with that effective legal counsel, uh, the, and with a court that was willing even to go to Duras uh, in Albania, where there are, of course, many Iranians in, in, in refuge and, and obtained testimony, uh, they ended up uh, convicting uh, uh, Mr. Nuri uh, uh, for some 100 murders. Uh, 61 years old at the time of his conviction, uh, back up the dates. Obviously, he was, you know, in his in his 20s when he was committing these crimes. He was a cog in a machine, and the, the leaders of that machine are now in even greater positions of power. Uh, but various countries that have been, been involved in universal jurisdiction have, have held that because these crimes are, are violations of essential uh, norms under international law, there are no immunities, even possible to go after the diplomats of a state. The diplomatic immunity doesn't apply. And so it's extremely important that uh, there be these, these, these prosecutions. But one of the things that I think is necessary for that kind of accountability to take place is, is something that, that the professor mentioned earlier, and that is uh, investigative mechanisms uh, at, the, at the United Nations. I mean, um, I'm deeply involved in the Syria case, and as you may know, in, in uh, this, of course, the Security Council completely blocked when it came to any kind of justice, any kind of international tribunal, any kind of referral to the, to the ICC blocked by, by, by Russian veto. Chinese veto in the case of the ICC referral. But uh, nonetheless, it was possible for the General Assembly in December of 2016 to establish a mechanism to gather evidence and to build files, uh, criminal files, that would meet the standards of proof beyond a reasonable doubt, and then work with prosecutors wherever uh, to, uh, to build those cases. And as a result, we've had some very successful cases, uh, frankly, of, of regime figures, uh, a colonel who was involved in in torture and, and, and murder in a Damascus detention facility, and of course also crimes committed by, by members of, of, of IS, uh, the Islamic State. Uh, recently an individual was convicted of genocide in a Frankfurt court because of his involvement in the genocide of, of Yazidis. He had a sexual slave, it was a Yazidi, and he killed the daughter of that slave by putting her out in, in, in temperatures of 120 degrees Fahrenheit or 50 degrees uh, Celsius. And, and as a result of the intent that he had to destroy that group, uh, he was convicted of genocide. But those cases take uh, uh, research, and, and, and not every country has the capacity, even of Sweden, to, to go to Albania to collect, uh, collect evidence. And that's why these mechanisms are so important. One of the ideas that's, that's out there now is that uh, instead of just having a mechanism for Syria, and we also have now one for Myanmar, uh, we need a broad international mechanism uh, that can swing into action in these situations, particularly when there are mandates like the mandate that we have already, uh, Professor uh, Raymond, uh, that could then assist uh, in building criminal cases. And, and if we can't have an international tribunal, and, and that is, as we know, uh, challenging given Iran's uh, allies in the Security Council and those obviously we've got Iran specifically assisting Russia in the aggression in, in Ukraine so we can't expect a Security Council action but we can uh, through the General Assembly through the Human Rights Council uh, establish a, a, a mechanism that can serve not just one or two situations but based upon the, the, the extent of the crime and the impunity and the seriousness uh, that we can have accountability uh, uh, and assistance uh, to uh, prosecutions in, in third countries so that justice will be done. As I said earlier, this culture of impunity has, has had horrendous consequences uh, in, in Iran, but it also uh, uh, threatens uh, our whole system of, of rules-based uh, uh, you know, order and, and, and the protection of, of, of civilian life and innocent life uh, everywhere in the world. And that's why it's so important uh, to continue this, this fight for justice for these uh, survivors uh, and for the victims of crimes everywhere. Thank you very much.